I'd like to preach to a sermon on testimonies of trust. Testimonies of trust from Psalm 16. Let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask for this. We'll ask His Spirit to tutor us in our study of His inspired and inherent word. Father, thank you for what you've written, what you've recorded and passed down, preserved for us. Lord, <coughs> we understand that many martyrs' blood has stained the pages to get the word of God into the hand of God's people. So, Lord, help us not take it for granted. Lord, let, let this book not collect dust on our shelves. Help us to dig into it like we looked at last week in having a life centered around the Word. Lord, we can't learn to trust you without having you speak to us through your Word. And so, Lord, we ask that you would teach us through the psalmist's faithful example on how to be more consistent in lives of trust with our Savior. In his name we pray and pray Amen. It's been said that no one is ready to live until he is first ready to die. Only in facing the reality of death will the living faith in God, not merely professing him, but we're talking about possessing him by repentant faith, that you're the real deal, that you're not the false convert of, of Matthew 7. Only once we've settled on eternity can we really live this life. Then you prepare to live boldly and courageously for him, even in the face of troubling, troubling ad adversity. That is to say, having eternity settled helps in this life. Think about it. We are eternal creatures. We're living eternal life right now. You're either going to live it in God's presence for eternity or out of his presence when you die in eternal conflict in hell. So, you know, think about it. This is, if you're redeemed, living in a fallen world is the closest to hell you're ever going to get. The pains and the difficulties and the tragedies we experience, though they are real, they are devastating, they are for a time in co contrast to eternity. To conquer the grave, man's greatest foe is everything. After all, what can man really do to us? Usher us into the Lord's presence, as if that's a bad thing. Back several years ago, I read the story of a man by the name of Randy Reed, a 34-year-old construction worker. He was welding on top of a nearly completed water tower outside of Chicago. According to writer Melissa Ramsdell, Reed unhooked his safety gear to reach for some pipes when a metal cage slipped and bumped the scaffolding he, that he stood on. You know where this story is going, don't you? The scaffolding tipped and Reed lost his balance. He fell 110 feet, landing face down on a pile of dirt, just missing rocks and construction debris. A fellow worker called 911. When paramedics arrived, they found Reed conscious, moving, and complaining of a sore back. Let that set in a minute. You know, apparently the fall didn't cost Reed his sense of humor. As paramedics carried him on a backboard to the ambulance, Reed had one request. Please, don't drop me. <laughs> Doctors later said Reed came away from the accident with just a bruised lung. Sometimes we resemble that construction worker. God protects us from harm in a 110-foot fall but we're still nervous about three-foot heights. Does that make any sense? And yet, that is where we live. The God who saved us from death, hell, and the grave can protect us from the smaller dangers that we face this week and the weeks to come should Jesus tarry. If he has already accomplished the greatest feat of reconciling sinful man to himself, Accomplishing eternal redemption, surely he can navigate us through the daily quandaries of life. David faced one of his many unknown trials. Psalm 16 is written at an unknown time, possibly faced threats to his life, like he often did. This psalm is a song of confident trust. He was able to live life to the fullest because he 
was gripped with a living hope in God beyond the grave. He was gripped by a resolute reliance on God in the face of death. And, beloved, I've got to say that Christians have not learned to find refuge in the Lord. They just haven't. Learning to seek Christ rather than chasing after the idols, the substitutes which are cheap and vain and empty. Let's get rid of the substitutes. Let's learn to run to Him. When life hurts, unless you have reckoned with death and have absolute confidence in resurrection because you are united with Christ, this can't be you. Whether you are with us today, you may be one who comes regularly, you may be on our live stream feed. That's why I'd encourage you, if you if you don't know that you're if you were to die today, if you would be in God's presence, talk with us. Come to him today before it's too late. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is the devil's day. Don't listen to the, the delusion and the lie that you've got more time. Just like I, I told you during providential weavings of life, we weren't in the text I was planning on. We don't want to boast about tomorrow. So would you follow along as I read for us the text and we will uh, unpack its great truths. Psalm 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God. For I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offerings of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my law. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he's at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen? You know, I, even before we get to the end of the text, I just got to say that if he says that in your presence is, the full, it is fullness of joy, that is to say that anywhere else there is not that joy. To be in Christ, as we read about in, in Ephesians 5, is to have all the spiritual blessings in the heavens poured out upon us. To be outside of Christ is to have nothing, though it may look like we have lots. So let me emphasize it a little differently. You have taken a giant step in the Christian walk, in your growth in Christ-likeness and in maturity, when you can wholeheartedly say to the Lord, as the psalmist does, I have no good apart from you. Verse 2. This psalm is a celebration of the joy of fellowship. So, so the psalmist doesn't stand in front of us with his looking down his hypocritical nose to condemn us for lacking in trust, but he comes alongside us to encourage us with the joy of fellowship that when you do get it right and you do seek Jesus, he meets you in such an amazing and, and profound way. I think hands down, one of the best biblical resources when I'm uh, trying to disciple a Christian who is really struggling with the, the uh, sovereign goodness of God is Jerry Bridges' book, Trusting God. Well, there's a, a little booklet that was shrunk down into, and Jerry says this, Dr. Bridges says, a couple of years ago, a large malignant tumor was found in my wife's abdominal cave. This was a few years, several years ago, because he's going home to be with Jesus. I think it was this last year, wasn't it? I don't remember. Anyways, he says, she went through radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and all the pain, nausea, months of anxious waiting that go along with this disease. Watching her suffer cut me to the heart as well. And after many months, the Lord ended her struggle through death. Our experience is nothing extraordinary these days. In fact, the past few years, I have had several friends with cancer listed on my urgent prayer page. 
But cancer or other physical ailments are not the only source of anxiety. Over lunch a few weeks ago, a business friend confided that his company is perilously close to bankruptcy. You know, you think about people's financial conditions post-COVID. Um, you know, or the the uh, heartache over a rebellious teenager. Or on a larger scale, we read in our daily newspapers of war and terrorism and earthquakes and famine. Racial inju injustice, murder, and exploitation in various parts of the world. The truth is, all of us face adversity. So the question naturally arises, where's God in this? Can you really trust God when adversity strikes and fills your life with pain? Does he indeed come to the rescue of those who seek him? Does he, as Psalm 50, verse 15 affirms, deliver those who call upon him in the day of trouble? Or is it all just wasted air? Can you trust God, dear friend? The question itself has two possible meanings. Can you trust God? In other words, is he dependable in times of adversity? But I think the second meaning is absolutely critical. Can you trust God? Do you have such a relationship with God and such a confidence in Him that you believe He is with you in your adversity even though you do not see any evidence of His presence and His power? One poem had uh, tried to capture it by saying when you can't see God's hand, trust His heart. What does your theology tell you? The psalmist had a robust theology of trust. His opening prayer is bolstered by two cycles of testimony. Notice them. Number one is his petition in verse one. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. With quiet confidence, he began to pray, keep me safe, O God. Yeah. In a way, he summarizes the whole psalm. Rich thoughts as he as he looks above in verses one and two, and he looks around in verses three and four. He looks within verses five to eight, and he looks beyond in verses nine through eleven. Maybe you would note these for your future meditation. Maybe you brought your writing Bible with you to church for our study today. You know, next to verses one and two, he looks above. Three and four, he looks around. 5 to 8, he looks within, and 9 to 11, he looks beyond. So as he looks above, what does he do? He, he prays. This is a petition for preservation. Now, that's not a new truth for us. We're not learning something new, but it sure is a great and apt reminder for us forgetful folks. This is a reminder, a lesson that is hard for us to remember, especially when life is fuzzy and you're in the midst of it. We are supposed to stir each other up to love and good deeds in the local church, are we not? And so we remind each other when we're forgetful that we have a God that preserves us. Is your first response in difficulty to pray? Actually, it would be good to even ask in good times if your first thing to do is to pray. If it's not, then we're probably not very thankful because there's a lot of items that we ought to just be bullet pointed up to the Lord. Lord, I just saw that accident. Help them and thank you for preserving me from accidents and all the other events throughout the day. So in good times and in bad times, is our response this kind of petition? The basis for such a request is that God was his refuge. He had put his trust exclusively in God. There was no plan B for David. Only God could protect David from the dangers in life. He couldn't find refuge in any other person or any other thing. You look at how people are lubricating life's hurt through alcohol or drugs or relationships and all the fulfillment and sustenance for life is to be found in one person and one person alone. 
In fact, the word used here in verse 1 for God is El, as in El Shaddai. It's the title used of the supreme deity and indicates his strength and his power. There's no one like this one that you turn to as far as strength and power. Weak and impotent man in humility must flee to the sovereign of the universe. I, I know that it, it doesn't help um, sob your self-esteem when, when a brother like me tells you that you're inadequate for life's events, but brother and sister, you're inadequate for life's events, and so am I. It is bad theology when we come alongside each other and say, you know, bro, God will never give you more than you can handle. Bull is my theological word for that. He always gives us more than we can handle so that we might run to him who is our adequacy. Amen? Beloved, we need the constant reminders that we're not the ones in control. We delude ourselves in thinking we're in more control than we really are. You know, even when you get, uh, we're, we're going into cold and flu season and everyone just icky, sticky, and yeah, stay away from me kind of thing, six feet plus. Um, praise him for illness. And any opposition that instructs us in this reality that I'm not in control, I am weak, I am inadequate, and so I run to him who is my sufficiency. Life is fleeting, it's frail, it can change in a moment. So we need to follow in the footsteps of the faith of David, who often looked to God in confident trust and asked for preservation. You know, this is not a, an isolated incident. You want to see his pattern? Go to the next chapter, Psalm, Psalm 17 and verse number 8. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. What, does God have wings? No, but he's, he's using this metaphor to picture that there is no greater protect, protection for a chiclet than underneath mom's wings. That is the safest place on planet Earth, unless you're in America where you slaughter your innocent ones in the womb. Get on the boat. Anyways, uh, back to preaching, Parker. Over in Psalm 140, we were uh, illustrating how this is not an isolated instance, but an ongoing practice in his life. Psalm 140 and verse 4. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have purposed to trip up my feet. Over in Psalm 141, verse 9. Keep me from the jaws of the trap which they have set for me. You know, when you want your pound of flesh from your enemy who did you wrong, David doesn't get that. He goes to the Lord and tattles on them to God. The one who can, can do the getting, right? Um, can I just confess in humility that as I preach this, I realize how desperately short I fall on running to the Lord. And as I walk alongside people, I realize that the, psalm, the psalmist in the psalms is one of the best examples to teach us how to run to the Lord. I've been involved in a year-long study of the psalms just trying to flesh out and push the envelope of the theology of seeking God. Because the psalmist demonstrates it time and time again. This must become our practice. Our well-worn path to Almighty. This single-mindedness is pointed to throughout the first six verses as you return back to Psalm 16. That of throwing in your lot with God in the realms of security, verse 1, you know, I find my refuge in you. Verse 2, his, his welfare. Verse 3, his associates, his, his worship, verse 4, and his ambitions, verse 5 and following. So let's further our track record. And learn the lessons well and difficulty not to be double-minded. James forbids us from being double-minded. Well, we, we trust the Lord, and then we're not trusting the Lord. Well, what is it? It's one or the other. Single-minded in our hope and our confidence. We've got a natural tendency to wonder why this difficulty? As if it is odd to face difficulty in this fallen world. In essence, the question 
uh, questions the sovereign. The exhaustive wisdom of a good God allowing and even causing consternation when he decides in his sovereign wisdom to put us in the pressure cooker. To mature us. Rather than us go through life half-baked. Learning that he is always good and faithful to persevere us through those difficulties. Verse 1 is the only prayer of this psalm. And David spends the rest of his words weaving together his personal testimonies of trust in the Lord. So let's move from his prayer to his testimonies. Verses number 2 through 4, we have a testimony of communion. Note that on the Matthew Bulletin as you're taking notes. His testimony of communion. Yes, we've got communion with the Lord, but typically we also look at the horizontal relationship as well. As image bearers, we are relational creatures. We are created with a neediness for others. We're dependent on God and we're interdependent. Are you trying to get through life without the body? There's a vital connection. Yes, we understand that we're not going to have a lot of deep gospel friendships in life, but you've got to have a few, few strands to your relational string. We are interdependent. But notice the perplexity. As he looks around, he tells of his affection for all lovers of God. Fellowship and seeking God together is not just a new covenant reality. You know, this, this communion that we're going to partake of at the end of our worship as the culmination of our worship of our worthy Lord today. The Lord's table pictures those who have been drawn near to God. And we've been drawn near together. Since Jesus drew each of us to himself, we'll confess in the Savior and Lord. Notice, first of all, the delight in fellowship he experiences with his fellow believers. He, he refers to the saints, as for the saints who are in the earth, verse 3, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. He's thankful. He had a deep love for the godly citizens of Israel. The Lord entered into covenant with Israel. Much of the nation, though, was pagan. Just because you were ethnic Israel doesn't, didn't mean that when you're offering your sacrifices that they represented your heart. Your sacrifices were empty ritual. If you were not following Yahweh. He's delighted in the fellowship of the saints. That term saints literally is holy ones as we render it in the New Testament. It's often used in the Old Testament of heavenly beings. But since David talks about these holy ones in the land and on the earth, that clarifies the phrase that he's not talking about heavenly beings, but those that are earthly beings. His brethren. The term is usually translated saints throughout the Psalms. These are the Hesedim, the royal or godly ones, as verse 10 refers to. When he says that you will not abandon my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your holy one undergo the king. God's people, they may not be perfect. They may drop the ball in our relationships with each other. But we should delight in their fellowship. And not the fellowship of the world's crowd. To say that is to say the world doesn't need to see any more object lessons of what it is to have honorary people in uh, arguments with each other. They see enough of that. We were studying Psalm 1 back a few weeks ago. Blessed is the one that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers. We, we understand that we are, are not to be, it's to sit in the place of Christ in our relationships. But if we be in the hands and feet of the Spirit in each other's lives, come alongside, sharing each other's joys and sorrows, 
The world needs our witness. But be cautious about loving the world. So as the psalmist looks around, he sees his fellow saints, and he is grateful for them. Continues to look around and tells of his aversion to all who worship any other. So there's a stark contrast. The ungodly who ran after other gods in religious syncretism that would only increase their sorrows. The psalmist talks about the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, I, we understand that to separate mankind out is not to be politically correct, but it is to be biblical. Right? There's a stark contrast between the compromisers and covenant people. Those who had weakened their loyalty to God, they are idolaters. So whereas he delighted in the saints, with disdain he detests the character of the ungodly. Again, as we seek not to walk in the world's counsel, back in the previous psalm, Psalm 15, verse 4. These are in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord and swears to his own hurt. So God blesses the saint, but he brings conflict into the life of the reprobate. Notice verse 4 of our psalm. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God, those who worship other than Yahweh, the, those sorrows be multiplied. Reminiscent of familiar words back in Genesis 3.16, words spoken to Eve. Sorrows multiplied due to sin. Painful, sorrowful, empty world, if that is your God. You know, if we were to develop our biblical, had time to develop our biblical theology here, living in a fallen world is hard. It's painful. And we need the company of the saints. And we're not going to um, straighten what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, God, God has made crooked. You try to figure out life under the sun without factoring God into the picture. God who created us to live for his glory. You're not going to make sense. Life is vanity under the sun without God at the helm of your life. So we see his testimony of communion both with the saints and with the Lord, not with the world. Thirdly, would you know the testimony of confidence in verses 5 to 11? His testimony of confidence. Notice again that he says, The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. Its past and present dimensions are verses 5 to 8. As he looks within, he buries himself like a bee in a flower in pure delights of communion with the Lord. He doesn't find satisfaction within himself, but in the object who is continually his lot. The Lord is the portion. As he engages in daily worship of his great God, the thought of God himself is David's heritage. And his voice so eloquently and since I mentioned the thought of God, if you don't have Maurice Roberts' thought of God, you're missing out. It's, it, there's so many books out there, good literature, to enlarge our understanding of God's greatness. You study more of the majesty and greatness of God, it'll flip our circuit breaker in your mind, just comprehending His greatness. Remember the Levites back in... Uh, Numbers 18, verses 20 and 24. God gave priests no block of territory to call their own. They don't have any land. Only the assurance, quote, I am your portion and your inheritance, unquote. That's what David experienced. Lord, you're my portion and inheritance. David and every singer of this psalm, this song, can meditate on the riches and reality of a God in transmission. God is the center of life. God is the center of the affections of our heart. 
Paul had matured to this point in his theology over in uh, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 21. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Over in chapter 3 of his epistle to the Philippians, verse number 8. I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of just knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, school on, dung, so that I might gain Christ. Take the world, give me Jesus. David said, Lord, you're, you're my portion, you're my inheritance. Augustine said that every heart is restless till they find their rest in him. So the Lord himself and divine blessing and overflowing goodness and provision. Verses 5 and 6 here are expressing David's total trust in the Lord because he seeks not just God's gifts, but he's seeking God himself. God is his heritage. It's beautiful to me. Some of the particular blessings of that heritage of God is to have him and enjoy guidance. Oh, down in verse number 7, he counsels me. He's going he's gonna to guide me through life. Verse 8, he's going to give me stability. He's at my right hand. I'm not going to be shaken because God's walking with me. About that resurrection in verse 9. And following. Leading off the end of the psalm in verse 11 with endless bliss. Guidance, stability, resurrection, endless bliss. That sounds pretty cool. Notice uh, verse 7 again. Uh, I'm going to bless the Lord who counseled me. God gives wisdom if you will but ask him. James, doesn't James tell us that? James 1, 5, then he lack wisdom. Let him figure it all out in front of it, right? Yeah. No. Then he may lack wisdom. Let him ask of God that gives to all men uh, stingy, right? Yeah. No. Gives to all men liberally, and since I did all my memory verses years ago in King James, he upbraideth not, simply meaning he doesn't scold us. He doesn't say, you ninny, you should have figured this out on your own. No, humility says I'm not going to figure it out on my own. If I, if I do figure it out on my own, I'm probably wrong. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. He gives to all men liberally, and yet praise not. God's ear is open to the repentant one who's asking for God's counsel, his guidance and direction. He can teach you in life's darkest moments just as much as in the light. This speaks of his guidance. That's why he said, I've set the Lord continually before me, verse 8. Does this not summarize what Jesus says in Psalm 6 and verse 33? After his disciples are wondering, what are we going to eat? What are we going to put on? And they're worked in a worrying, sinful frenzy of how are we going to figure this out and provide? Jesus said, no, no. Seek my kingdom and my righteousness. I got the rest of this in the bag. I'll take care of it all. Now that verse 8 here in our text is a familiar verse to many Jewish people today. Most Jewish homes have a, a Shabbiti plaque on the wall. The word means, I have set. We can only wish that they would know as well and be convinced of the following truths of Messiah. This is a place of undivided focus and exclusive preeminence. So David would not be shaken come hell or high water no matter what the obstacle. Not going to be shaken. God was unmovable and so was his saint David. It refers to stability in the psalmist's life. 
regardless of circumstances in which he find himself. He's even healed, not on again, off again. The Lord's at my right hand. I won't be shaken. Suggest a person standing beside another, as in court or battle. When you go to battle, actually one of my boys just learned this uh, as they were going as he was going through boot camp. He had to have a battle battle buddy, and there wasn't just times where you're carrying your battle buddy, hoping they don't weigh too much. But uh, knowing that you got a battle buddy, you got somebody's got your back. That makes all the difference. You're not out, out on your own. You're not a loner. David instructs us in that. About the present and future dynamics in verses 9 through 11. So looking beyond, he's given assurance of immortal life. One of the few Old Testament passages that we have before us that deal with the resurrection. In Psalm 49, verse 5, verse 15, the psalmist says, God will ransom my soul from Sheol. What's Sheol? Sheol is the place of the dead. God didn't just have my life and keep me safe as a refuge from my enemies in this present life. You're not going to abandon me in the grave. You're not going to undergo decay. You'll make known to me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. So there's few Old Testament passages referring to resurrection. This is applied by Peter at Pentecost. Peter's great Pentecostal sermon to the resurrection of Messiah, an argument that is hard to refute. Having a resurrected Messiah makes all the difference. If we serve a dead God, what good is he when we get dead? Or what good are we when we get dead? Like he was. Again, we're not trying to use New Testament to um, interpret the Old Testament like the Old Testament David couldn't stand on his own feet. But Scripture does interpret Scripture, does it not? And Scripture illustrates Scripture. So with this theme on resurrection, the theology of resurrection that guarded David's heart, Paul's rendition to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we're of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. That first fruits, he's the first one resurrected, guaranteeing that the second, the third, and what comes after will be resurrected through faith in his name. According to his mercy, Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 3, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, not a dead hope, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. When Peter quotes this verse in his sermon, he quotes the Greek Septuagint, a prophecy of Messiah for whom alone such words would be perfectly and literally true. David's words even transcended his own experience and became historically true in Christ. When he says in verse 10, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. So God is the psalmist's portion of life and delivering death. It doesn't get any better. Is that your confidence, dear friend? Resurrection, deliverance from the realm of the dead. Since Peter did give that application in uh, Acts 2 and verse 25, I'll get there eventually. Acts 2 25, David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You've made known to me the ways of life. You'll make me full of gladness with your presence. David understood the reference. Paul tied into it. 
in this covenant with David. God's not going to abandon David or God's promised seed in the grave. God doesn't give up on friends. David understood that. You're not going to abandon me. Now, I usually don't refer to some well-known poems that have done more for making money for people in the marketplace, but some of you have probably seen this poem on uh, plaques, Footprints in the Sand. One night a man had a dream, he dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord across the sky, flashed scenes from his life, and each scene he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times in his life. This really bothered him, and he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you most, you would leave me. Now, before you look down your hypocritical nose, he's picturing what we tend to do, right? The Lord replied, my son, my precious child, I love you. I would never leave you during your times of trial and suffering. When you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Not the other way around. Lord, you will make known to me the path of life. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Because the Lord was at David's right hand, verse 8, he would one day be at the Lord's right hand, where he'd enjoy eternal pleasures. This path of life would ultimately lead to God's presence in heaven, where he'd experience an overflowing, undiminished joy. But not only pathway to life eternal, but to walk this way is to really live in this present life. In the truest sense of the word, leading us without breaking into God's presence and into eternity. So much more we could probably say. David's got good fellowship. Got a good inheritance. He's got good counsel and he's got a good hope. We look at life. Life in this world typically going to end without warning. Sometimes we can see when the gavel of death is going to be dropped on us, but it's going to end on the most part without warning. Death rarely sends its advance notice. So the scriptural imperative is for every saint of God to live every moment of every day as if it were their last. Because as we said earlier, a man's not ready to live until he's ready to die. Because we've taken care of the death thing, we can be the only ones who can really live in this life. Richard Baxter once said, always preach as a dying man to dying men as if never sure to preach again. I might not be here next week. God might take me out. That we maximize the time God's given us for His glory. Only in living as dying men will believers live as God intends. Believers fix their hope in God, who is the only safe refuge from the deadly dangers which threaten the righteous. Yes, now that we've got the completed canon, all 66 books of the Bible, after the progress of revelation, God revealing his perfect word, we've got a full doctrine of resurrection. Gives us confidence that when we die, God will not allow death to destroy the full fellowship that we enjoy with the Lord. To lay our breath down, to be absent from this physical body, to be in his presence, instantaneous. All made possible because Christ conquered death and he rose to become the first fruits of all who sleep. So dear friend, learn from David this day to set the Lord before you. Constantly meditating upon his rock solid character. Because if you can trust him with your eternity, you can trust 
trust him with today, tomorrow if you wake up and it's tomorrow, and the next day. Only with your focus aggressively riveted on him will he become your delight. Constantly remember that he has brought us to the path of life and he alone can bring joy and eternal pleasures. I trust that Psalm 16 will have given you a more God-satisfied vision that you can boldly exclaim as Thomas Brooks did. Hope can see heaven through the thickest clouds. God, what a precious psalm that you have given us to sing and to pray back to you. Precious truths that are as rock solid as your character. God, would you keep us safe and faithful? You're our Lord. Teach us obedience. You are master. We are slave. Thank you for your blessings. Forgive us for taking them for granted. We praise you for your counsel, constantly schooling us in your truths about who you are and what you expect of us. Father, thank you for being with us and strengthening us. And would you continue, should you give us another day, show us the path of life and give us joy. For your eternal praise we ask it. Amen. I would invite you to take your COVID, COVID packaged communion elements, all safety <coughs> packaged. And uh, you know, a year ago we never we never dreamed of such a thing. How much we take for granted in the church? If the doors will be open, the lights will be on, we'll just carry on worshiping Jesus like we've done for years. It's not. Take it for granted. Let's pray that we would live up to date. I trust you got this week's email and <coughs> you the Lord's table that you came with your heart prepared to know Christ as Savior and invite you to partake with us. This, uh, we do not uh, practice closed communion here, but if, if you don't know Christ, just let it pass. It's not a religious ritual. Uh, talk with us about Christ. We'd love to introduce you to the God that you already know exists. And he presents himself as Savior to all who will repent and believe. If you want to take that first tab off of the wafer, which pictures the body of Jesus. Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. Different kind of bread today, but it symbolizes the same way it was meant to that night. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus gave his body for sinners such as us. This is the language of substitution for you. And so remember him. Lord, help our remembrance this day to not be usual of the every other week Lord's table. But we would afresh contemplate the one who lived the perfect life of righteousness and the Father's law that we could not and died the death that each one deserved. Lord, we thank you that when sinners like us could not work our way into your presence, we could not get to God, a holy God, a thrice holy God, the one who is holy, 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 that you in the form of your own son came into sinful man, you robed yourself in human flesh, you became and experienced everything, every kind of temptation that we experience, lust of the flesh, lust of the body, Bless the flesh, bless the eyes, and boast of the pride of life. And yet you experienced every temptation without sin. It did not flip the switch of a corrupt heart. Amazing, Lord. That you would set aside the independent exercise of your own deity, you who was worshipped for eternity, would come experience hunger and thirst. 
So that everything that you did, every person that you healed, every person you raised from the dead, you did through the power of the Spirit. You limited yourself by putting on human flesh. Lord, we can never figure this out. So it causes us to get lost in wonder, love, and praise. Might this bread picture and reflect in our own hearts that when we could not come to you, you came to us. And Lord, as we partake of the juice, remind us that without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. There must be bloodshed. We thank you that it was the blood of the innocent one shed for us guilty ones. We pray in your name.